At this time, it is my great honor and privilege to call upon our Grand Master, illustrious brother, Thomas K. Sturgeon, 33rd degree, by worship of Grand Master, of Pennsylvania, and an active member of this own family. Thank you very much. Illustrious Commander-in-Chief, my distinguished dais, and most importantly, a distinguished people, brothers and ladies throughout this whole room, thank you so much. My fellow Masons across Pennsylvania, it is a great pleasure for me to be here and to try to explain to you why I felt we needed a Masonic Renaissance and what the importance of it was. I can better explain it to you by, like this. In 1969, I was the worshipful master of my lodge in Oakdale, Pennsylvania, and they presented me a gavel, a red rosewood gavel with a nice band around it, and it had all the stuff on about me being the worshipful master in 1969. When 1969 was over, I took that gavel home and I put it on a bookcase. And then, in 2009, my two brothers asked to have that gavel. They took it back and they put a new band around it. And it added the part about being the Grand Master. When I put that gavel on the bookshelf in 19, 1969, we had uh, 255,000 Masons across the great state of Pennsylvania. And when I took it back off, the, off that bookcase, we have 113,000 Masons in Pennsylvania. We have gone now for 50 consecutive years with showing a decrease in member for every year. I believe it takes courage to change, and it takes a commitment to do and have the courage to change. It all started for us 280 years ago in Philadelphia when a group of men decided they were going to form a Masonic Lodge and a Grand Lodge. And for all those years, for 280 years, this fraternity in Pennsylvania has thrived, and it has been what it is always intended to be. But throughout those 280 years, almost every single generation of Masons in this state improved our fraternity and maintained it and kept it going for the perpetuity of the long term. I think the generation we have today is the one that is the most questionable because if we keep losing members, we're going to be in a lot of problems across the state. Our fraternity is not real healthy. And I don't mean to be negative to all of you, but it's not real healthy. And the facts are that you can't cure cancer with Vicks Vapor Rub, and you can't cure the ills of this fraternity with good intentions and no action. And so when you elected me to be your Grand Master, I decided that it was important for me to give all that I had to try to make the fraternity turn around and become something we all want it to be. And to do that, it took courage on my part, it took new ideas, but across the state, I believe now we are beginning to show that things are turning around, and I'm very proud to tell you that. You have to remember something about our fraternity, and I want you all not to ever forget this. There's two sides to this great fraternity. There's the part that we all love, that fraternal side, the side with brotherly love, the side where men have a bond of fraternal friendship that no one can ever describe or take away. And that's the side we all like the best. But beyond that side, there's a financial side and a fiscal side. And that's the side we haven't done very good with. If we want to continue our fraternity to flourish, to be here for years to come, we have to make certain that our membership is large enough that we can support all of the charities we have to support our 2,600 people in our Masonic villages, to support the greatest Masonic temple in the United States of America that you're all part owner of. We, if we want this to last, we have to turn this around. If we go down to 40 or 50,000 Masons and we don't, we're on the way to there if we don't do something about it, then we're going to have a problem. And then who's going to care for all these things? You know, across the state of Pennsylvania, there are, we are real estate poor. There are lodges in every little town across the state. And by the way, our Grand Lodge building in Philadelphia, we struggle every minute of every day trying to find enough money to make that building go on the way we want it to be. Why? Because we haven't kept our fees and dues up with any kind of contemporary uh, common sense, and the membership goes down. 
it's a terrible situation when you have lack of income and your, in, and your expenses keep rising. That's catastrophic, and you can't run your homes that way, can you? You can't run the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania that way either. So the only way we can do it is to try to create more members. I don't think anyone in this fraternity is going to go for the idea of quadrupling our dues or making them five times of what they are. In the Pennsylvania Freemason, I hope you all look at the charts that are there. The charts are clear, clear proof of how we haven't done a good job financially, and they're clear proof as to where the trend of this fraternity is going at this time. So why do we need a renaissance? I think that's the reason we need it. But it's one thing to say we need one. I'm here to tell you and give you some solutions as to why and how I think we can make it better. First, we need to be more contemporary to 2010 than we were to 1910. Our fraternity has not changed very much in 100 years, but we need to change it now if we're going to be successful. Everything in this world has changed. One of the things I said we could do for the first time in Pennsylvania history is we could have selective invitation that each of you could ask, ask somebody to be a Freemason. There are people who think I'm not right about doing that. But I want you all to know that I think that if you think this, or, this organization of Freemasonry is as good as we all pro, uh, promo, it to be, promo it to be, then you, why not ask somebody? Why not invite a good man of moral and ethical character to join our fraternity? Why shouldn't we ask them? I mean, what are we waiting for? You know, the time has come to be different, for change. And I, ask, I request all of you to take advantage of that. And as an afterthought, let me say that it, it's a practice that's been committed in Pennsylvania for years anyhow, for a great degree. But we're, now we're going to make it legal and make it right. I say to you that any of you who are over 60 years old, if you recruit two young men under 30, you'll be exempt from your lodge and grand lodge dues for life. Some people say that's selling, and I say they're right. It is. And I'm not ashamed to try to sell the greatest fraternity in the history of mankind. I'm not ashamed of that at all. I'm here to tell you this time we start selling it before it goes away and we don't have it to be around anymore. One of the things I don't like about our fraternity sometimes is we bring a person into our fraternity from the, from the preparing room. We bring them to this great Masonic light. And more often than not, the, degree, the ritual work is not being done with any tremendous proficiency. There's nobody on the sidelines. And then we wonder, I wonder why that person didn't come back. It makes me think that it's time now we need to raise the quality of our degrees by using all-star degree teams and doing district-wide conferrals and bring people into the, into the lodge in a larger number, have the sidelines full, and have the very, very best person conferring the degrees. Then, I think, we start to improve and impress people for what we really are. I made a decision that you can bring more than five people in in one day. I don't know where that ever came from, but to my way of thinking, it's, ar it's archaic and it's time to change it. If, you, if you're at a little lodge somewhere out there in, in, the, in, the, in this little town in Pennsylvania and ten people want to join, let's bring them in and welcome them to our fraternity and welcome them for all that we have to offer. I believe that the ritual between the degrees needs to be changed a little bit. I have just authorized, and it just came out just this week, the new mentor program that, that our Committee of Masonic Education so eloquently put together. And it's a mentor program now that says you don't have to memorize the oath and obligation word for word, but it says we're going to make you learn what was in that oath and obligation, and you're going to know all the elements of it, and you're going to learn all about this, this fraternity, you're going to learn about where we came from, what we did, what our goodness is, the, the charities that we take care of. You're going to learn about the greatness of Freemasonry because I believe that when a man walks out of a Freemason's hall as a third degree Mason and he walks down the street, we need to have someone come up to him and they say, what's that fraternity about? We need to have him not say, I can't tell you. We need to have him tell them what this Freemasonry is about and all the goodness that we do and all the goodness we've done for 280 years and the goodness we're going to continue to do for another 280 years with all your help. Some people were concerned when I printed the ritual the first time in Pennsylvania's history. But we were one of the last Grand Lodges to do that. It was, it's not novel. In fact, we were way behind times.
but even in printing the ritual, where we can get more people to learn it. And, uh, and I talked to the director of the ritualistic work today, and his report, reports in from, the, from all the schools of instruction is that we have more people learning the work today than we have for years and years and years. But when I printed that ritual, I didn't print it all. I coded some of it. And I coded it not because I thought it needed to be coded for a secret reason. I coded it because I still want the necessity of two men to get together and, and have a bond of friendship as they learn that final little piece of our ritual. So I think our, it's time we do that. You know, the facts are that 50 years ago, there were about 30% of the households in this country that were dual income. Today, 85% of the households are dual income. Men come home from work today and wash clothes and cook, cook supper and wash dishes and do all the things that heretofore were kind of women's kind of duties. That's all changed. And if we want that man to be able to learn our ritual, it's time that he can pick up a book at 10 o'clock at night when the family's in bed or when he gets some spare time or when he's on the road or in a train or an airplane and he can learn our beautiful ritual. I printed the ritual, but I like the ritual as much as anybody in this room. I, I liked it enough that I created a proficiency award pin for people who would learn all three of the, uh, the symbolic degrees and would give them a special pin for, for, the, for the, what they've done. I've asked all of you to have shorter meetings. Some people say, well, you know, he's taken all the symbolism away from this thing. It's not the symbolism. Let me explain to some of you how it works. At a meeting, we open the meeting, and the worshipful master turns to the senior deacon, and he brings him up, and he whispers something to him. And the senior deacon takes a little bit of time, and he walks all the way across the room. He whispers the same thing to the senior warden. Then he walks back, and then the junior deacon goes up to the, to the senior warden, and he whispers something to him. And then the junior deacon comes back, and he carries it down to the junior warden. He whispers it to him, and then he walks back. Now we've had five or ten minutes, and as soon as we get done with it, the senior warden says it out loud in the open lodge. <laughs> Tell me what sense that makes. Some of the other interesting things that I did that I want, that I want you all to participate in and understand. We de I've decided and we're working on it now and it's getting, it's getting really kicking in now where you can pay your dues with a, with a withdrawal from your checking account or pay your dues with a credit card. It should make it easier for us and it should eliminate some of the suspensions. We have incentives for membership. I won't go into them. They're in the Pennsylvania Freemason. We want you to go out and work hard for it. We had a Masonic Congress for all the pendant bodies just recently in Elizabethtown. And out of, that Masonic, out of that Masonic Congress came some changes and things that I issued decisions on that will help all the appendant bodies throughout Pennsylvania. I've agreed that the Grand Master should not be able to expel people from Freemasonry illegally anymore and that every Mason should have a due process of, of justice. And we're changing that and you'll vote on that in December. I've asked all the lodges to adopt a resident in our Masonic villages because I think it's time that we act the way we talk and that we have 2,600 people there, every lodge should be down there helping those people in any little way they can, even if it's taking them to lunch, sending them a card on their birthday, or showing the love and the concern of what we really stand for. I've asked every lodge to commit some public service work across in their own little communities across the state. I told the lodges there shouldn't be a lodge in this, there shouldn't be a lodge in this state that doesn't have their name and the Masonic uh, em emblem on the outfield fence of the Little League ball field. And I'm telling you, that's starting to take place too. We, uh, we need to change the way people think about us. We need to change our visibility. And we need to make people recognize that the Masons of Pennsylvania are a good group of men who have good ideas and they're not a group of old men going into old buildings talking about old subjects of which people think is secret and cultish. We need to get beyond that. You know, I made these changes and I went 25 times and all of my Grand Lodge officers went with me, every one of them. We had 25 regional meetings across the state and we tried to explain this to the people, to our brothers. And I still think we won a lot of people over. I think there's still only a very small group of people who don't agree. I know that everybody in this room does not agree with everything that I did. I know that. But I, what I'm trying to convince all of you is to be, to be, to be flexible, to be con uh, concerned enough to be understanding 
and, to, and the one you don't like to kind of outweigh it with all the good things because we need to change our fraternity and I'm asking all of you to do that. I could have stayed in Philadelphia or in my home in Pittsburgh and I didn't have to come around to 25 meetings and I didn't have to be here tonight to try to win all of you over, the ones that need to win over. But my deal was this. You elected me. I made a commitment for change. And I stand before you and every group across this state for the first six months of this year. And I stand there to, to make my case. And I stand there to take any medicine that people choose to give to me. I respect every single person who disagrees with me. I respect your right to disagree. I don't, think, I don't see a problem with that. But I'm not going to change because you disagree with me or because we can't agree. I'm committed for the long term. And I'll tell you that our Grand Lodge officers are committed to it also. This Renaissance idea is going to go on for at least six and a half or seven more years. In October, we're having a one-day Masonic journey where you can join the fraternity in one day. I'm asking all of you to take advantage of that. We can rebuild this fraternity, and the, the one-day class is a way to do it. The one-day Masonic journey, you can join the Masons, the Scottish Rite, and the Shrine all in one day. My mission is to change the fraternity. My mission is to give it life, to give it a chance to survive, to give it a chance for the next generation and the one after that. And I recognize, if you look at the charts, you can recognize also that it won't work if we just stand by waiting for it. There are, there are those out there who say, just give it time, it'll change. My brethren and ladies, I gave you 60 years and you didn't make a change. I'm going to make a change. And the Grand Lodge officers and the district deputies and the great Masons of Pennsylvania are going to make a change today. Some people think we should change it back. I don't think so. I want to make this fraternity back. I want to change it. I want to change it back. I want to change it back to its previous greatness. That's what I want. I want this thing not to be extinct and not to be gone. Everything we've done is for the betterment of you, those who follow us, and most importantly, those who kept it going all these years. I think we have a, an obligation to them to make this fraternity last. I just want to say a couple things about printing the ritual because some people have found that very, very, very uh, wrong. First of all, we're the last ones to print the ritual. Facts are that we printed our ritual makes us more current. It's the first time in the history of the Grand Lodge we actually had an authorized exact version of our ritual. The truth is you can go to Amazon.com or anywhere else and you can Google ritual, Freemasonry ritual and it's all there. You can watch the Discovery Channel and get the secret word of the third degree if you choose to. So who are we kidding? May, let's make it easier for someone to learn. That's the important part of it. But the truth of the matter is, and I've been criticized by it, but the truth of the matter is, what is the true secret of our fraternity? What's the true secret? I believe the true secret is the depth of the bonds of brotherly love and fraternal affection that we have for one another and the transformation that's undergone when becoming a new Mason and traveling that same road that a Mason before us traveled. I think it's the tradition of moral excellence and the virtue of men. I think it's the secret, the secret's not in the ritual, but the secret is within the ritual. The true secret of this fraternity is how each and every one of you feel about the people sitting at your table or about how I feel about each of you. That indescribable bond that can never be described and never be, never be defined. That is the true secret of Freemasonry. It's not in the ritual. And besides that, let's assume someone reads, reads the ritual in, in, on, the, on in the internet or at Google. That no more makes that person a Mason than me watching the Super Bowl makes me Peyton Manning. So just don't worry about it. Because the secret's not in those words. The secret is in the way we feel about each other. Don't you ever feel it? Do you, any of you feel it? I watched tonight over there and there were men over there with heavy hearts because they were so pleased to see their friend be rewarded here. 
That's the secret of the fraternity. That's the secret we could take back forever and ever. Soren Kierkegaard, a theologian, theologian in the earlier century, said life can only be understood by looking back, but it can only be lived by looking forward. My brother and ladies, we must emancipate ourselves from the status quo and recognize that to do nothing is to gain nothing, and to gain nothing is an absolute failure. If we do what we've always done, we're going to get what we've always gotten. If we all think alike, none of us are thinking. It's axiomatic that to do nothing and perpetuate the status quo is like denying treatment of a fraternity that needs our care. Abraham Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first, hour sharpening, the first four hours sharpening my ax. The time has come, my brethren and ladies, the time has come for us to sharpen our ax. The time has come for us to join together and live the obligation we've taken. The time has come when we need to decide that it's up to us. It's not up to the last generation. It's not up to the next one. It's up to us. It's not up to the guy in front of you or the guy beside you. It's up to you and it's up to me. I'm committed. I want you to be committed. Anything I've done came from the most deepest part of my heart. And you all need to know that. I did it because I care. The easy way would have been to do nothing. I could be popular and I'd be and do nothing. And when I leave, we'd be 6,000 Masons less than when I got here. And that's not the way I want to operate. And I want you to understand that if we go together, hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder, Freemasonry in Pennsylvania will come alive, it will live again, and we will do our share to make this organization a strong, vibrant, and be around for the next 280 years. Join with me, and I'll join with you, and let's go get them. Thank you very much. Thank you.